hers has been one of the most welcome, and unusual, contributions of the entire Brexit debate. Not only were the Queen's words a badly needed dose of common sense but they were supremely understated, too. Her speech was neither delivered to Parliament nor to some shiny corporate Congress. There is no recording of this week's address to the Sandringham Women's Institute, let alone any camera footage. There was not a single reporter or a politician in the room. But let no one in be in any doubt. The Queen was talking about Brexit. And as the only person in public life today who was personally, and sometimes painfully, embroiled in every stage of Britain's entry into what we now call the European Union, she speaks with peerless authority as we leave. It could hardly have been a more low-key event. The only man inside West Newton Village Hall for this traditionally all-female affair was guest speaker Alexander Armstrong, the TV presenter. Her Majesty's private secretary, Edward Young, was not present. The Queen has attended this event since 1943, staying a couple of hours, enjoying a proper catch-up with familiar faces, some of whom she has known all their lives. However, this year, it was announced that she would say a few words, too, ostensibly because the Sandringham Y was celebrating its 100th birthday. She is its longest-serving stalwart. She began by paying tribute to Madge Watt, the formidable founding mother who established the branch in the aftermath of the First World War. And then she switched to a more general theme. Reflecting on a century of change, she said, it is clear that the qualities of the Y endure. The continued emphasis on patience, friendship, a strong community focus, and considering the needs of others, are as important today as they were when the group was founded. Of course, every generation faces fresh challenges and opportunities. As we look for new answers in the modern age, I for one prefer the tried and tested recipes, like speaking well of each other and respecting different points of view, coming together to seek out the common ground and never losing sight of the bigger picture. To me, these approaches are timeless, and I commend them to everyone. This was not an official engagement, it was not even mentioned in the court circular yesterday. Buckingham Palace would normally treat it as an entirely private affair. As such, her words were entirely personal, not on advice as official speeches are known. Yet no sooner had the Queen returned to Sandringham than something unusual occurred. The palace press office released the text of her speech to news organizations. Evidently, the Queen wanted her plea for unity to reach a wider audience. And with good reason. In times of trouble, it is the monarchy which has been expected to reassure, to stabilize, to keep calm and carry on. Politicians govern and the monarch leads, usually by example. The Queen's parents were exemplars of that in the Second World War. She herself has been here before. As with her plea for the Scottish people to think very carefully before the 2014 independence referendum. As it happens, those were also private remarks, to a handful of people outside Craddy Church. There was also Brexit code in last month's Christmas broadcast. Even with the most deeply held differences, treating the other person with respect and as a fellow human being is always a good first step, the Queen said. Every side in this saga has tried to claim the Queen at some point. Some argued that she was a closet Brexiteer on the back of a third-hand story of a private lunch conversation years before the referendum had been called. Remainers, on the other hand, embraced her as one of their own when she opened Parliament in 2017 wearing a hat in EU blue with yellow stars. This week's words could be construed as an attack on Jeremy Corbyn for not coming together with the Prime Minister. Alternatively, they could be a coded attack on no-deal Tories and her reference to the common ground. Take your pick, for, in fact, these words lean in no political direction. Crucially, she well remembers how Britain ended up in the EU in the first place. It was a very turbulent journey for her and she has not forgotten it. In the early 60s, when the government first voiced its intention to join what was then known as the European Economic Community, EEC, there was dismay around the Commonwealth. Countries such as Australia and New Zealand depended on exports to Britain. It was less than 20 years since a war in which thousands of their young men had fought and died at Britain's side. Yet, in the eyes of many, the mother country was turning her back and canoodling with the old enemy. 
What made it particularly difficult for the Queen was that she was their monarch, too. Researching my new book, Queen of the World, I unearthed many classified files which reveal the impact on the Queen herself. Take her 1963 tour of Australia and New Zealand. Unlike her triumphal coronation tour of 1953-4, the crowds were much less enthusiastic. The New Zealand government was initially reluctant to invite the Queen at all. The British High Commissioner, Francis Cumming Bruce, reported back to London that the small crowd in the capital was mainly silent and there was little waving. The Queen herself looked drawn and very tired. The Commonwealth Office was appalled and demanded an urgent report from British diplomats in Canberra and Wellington. Cumming Bruce was blunt. Eighteen months of negotiations of British membership of the EEC shook New Zealand opinion profoundly, he wrote. It had been a severe shock. As the British government pressed on with its EEC plans, previously loyal subjects started to question their devotion to the Queen. Australia's Deputy Prime Minister, Doug Anthony, renounced a lifetime's loyalty and joined the Republican movement. France's President Charles de Gaulle had been the main barrier to Britain's EEC membership, but his successor, Georges Pompidou, was keen on the idea. By 1972, a deal was almost complete. Pompidou and Prime Minister Edward Heath wanted the Queen to pay a spectacular state visit to France ahead of Britain's formal accession on January 1, 1973. The crowning moment would be a banquet at Versailles where Heath wanted the Queen to deliver, in French, a rousing eulogy to the EEC. I have seen confidential papers showing how the government wanted her to hail the EEC as a partnership speaking on great matters with one voice and gathering the genius of many. That was one of the lines chopped by the palace. For the fact was that Parliament was every bit as divided on the issue then as it is today. Yet ministers repeatedly urged the royal family to trumpet the joys of Europe. Prince Charles's diaries reveal that Heath had assured him personally that the EEC would make no impact on the Commonwealth at all. The Queen spoke similarly in her 1972 Christmas broadcast, saying, Britain is about to join her neighbours in the European community and you may well ask how this will affect the Commonwealth. Reassuringly, she went on, the new links with Europe will not replace those with the Commonwealth. Old friends will not be lost. Except everything did change. Europeans no longer had to queue with the rest of the world at British customs posts, whereas loyal Kiwis and Australians did. Within a year, Australia had been God Save the Queen as the national anthem. A Republican bandwagon was underway. So is it any wonder that the Queen wants everyone to be nicer to each other? As our political class is paralyzed by our departure from the EU, our wise head of state still recalls the rancor and pain of going in. We should heed her words.